in Pastor Chris Castaldo's work on the Beatitudes, this uh, short little book that I do recommend called The Upside Down Kingdom, um, Pastor Chris describes uh, one great example of meekness, um, of the kind of meekness that we will be discussing here um, in our sermon today. He talks about how in the mid-1420s, um, a man named Branch Rickey, president and general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, wanted to break the color barrier in professional baseball. And this man chose Jackie Robinson, uh, an outstanding player in the Negro league, Leagues who had excelled in four sports while in UCLA to be that player. In their initial meeting, uh, Ricky warned Robinson that he would face opposition from teammates, uh, that he would face vicious fans and even opposing pitchers who might knock him down with the fastball. But in that meeting, Ricky asked, Ro or and in that meeting, Ricky asked Robinson if he would be able to endure all the harassment that was about to come his way without losing his cool. It was a serious question, but Robinson you know, was a competitive, strong, and aggressive player. It wasn't natural for him to back down from anything. And yet, uh, Robinson responded to Ricky in the affirmative, um, that he resolved that he would break baseball's ugly color barrier one of Robinson's teammates, a pitcher named Lee Fund, was among the few players who befriended him while he was on, on the Dodgers. And in an interview that, um, that Castaldo uh, conducted with Fund a few years ago, he suggested that Robinson's earnest faith was an essential part of his story. What is most inspiring, Fund said, was the way Jackie looked specifically to Christ as his example. He says that never in my years with him on and off the field did I ever see him lose his cool. That this gentle strength was on display for all to see. He possessed a meekness that ultimately was victorious. Well, how did Robinson do it? Uh, do it? According to Fun, this is part of Jackie Robinson's story that is often overlooked. That Jackie Robinson was a, was a very sincere Christian. And he was a Christian who sought to emulate the example of Jesus. In the face of injustice, he routinely quelled his righteous anger by remembering the one who said, I am gentle and humble in heart. The one who was reviled but did not revile in return. The one who, when he suffered, did not threaten but entrusted himself to the one who judges justice. I think all of us... Um, hopefully in our experience as Christians and in our uh, fondness for the history of, of the church, have heard of such great examples, um, examples of true Christian meekness. This idea of meekness that we're going to cover today and, and the blessings of uh, the blessedness of meekness, on the one hand, it's very easy to understand on the surface. This is not like a tough one to grasp. But on the other hand, it is hard to grasp all the implications that the command to, or that the blessed promises for, we, uh, for those who are meek, there's an implication that rests on our lives, and that can be difficult to embrace. This is one of the preeminent qualities of Christ and those who are joined to his kingdom. And it's imperative for us this morning to understand not just what it means to be meek, but how meekness as a, as a concept and concept and humility well, how these things should shape our imagination for what true victory looks like in the kingdom of heaven. Now, make no mistake, if you are in Christ, as this simple verse tells us in verse 5, you are to inherit the earth, the entirety of the earth. But the way that we get from here to there, while well, is oftentimes very counterintuitive, and it's prone to all sorts of misunderstandings. And it's in attacking those misunderstandings and teasing this out. That's what we're going to take on this morning uh, over the next, um, over the, our, our time together. And we're going to do so, once again, under, under three headings. The first of which is, meek means meek. Yeah. Point number one, meek means meek. There's no pastor tricks with this one. There's no sleight of hand. There's no wittiness that comes along with, with this uh, with this quality, with this beatitude. 
Meekness means exactly what you think it means. It's this idea of gentleness, right? Modesty. It's, it's often used as a synonym um, interchangeably throughout both Old and New Testament for humility. And it, ex it expresses this idea of, of restraint. And the scriptures are not, are not confused. Uh, you find this all over the place. We find it consistently from, once again, from Old to New. And oftentimes that Old Testament Greek version uses the very same term that we have, that we have here. Um, it appears very early, in, even, even all the way back to the Pentateuch. And for example, in, in Numbers chapter 12, which, now, which is kind of humorous because remember, um, Moses wrote the Pentateuch, and yet it's recorded as saying, now Moses was a very meek or humble man, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. It's a, it's a humble brag if you've ever, if you've ever seen one. But it is that word and that idea of humility. Uh, Moses was the most meek and humble man. He was very humble um, upon the earth. As we read in Psalm 37, that whole, that whole uh, section that we read is a description of the meek and the humble one and the way in which the humble moves about in the world. And such people, the meek, as it says in verse 11, are those who shall inherit the land. Our beatitude here is, is, is an expansion and a commentary, and you know, Christ is taking up those ideas that are expressed in the 37th Psalm um, and expanding the promises, as we'll, as we'll find out. Well, as you jump to the New Testament, you find the idea of meekness and gentleness or meekness and humility all over the place as well. Uh, so when you think about the fruit of the Spirit that's listed in the place uh, or um, that's listed in the, in the New Testament, we're told that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, which uh, lexically that, work, that word is associated with what's used here for, for meekness. We also find it in other places as, as well, um, like in 1 Peter 3, when, uh, when Peter has given instructions to households, he says to wives in 1 Peter 3, verse 3, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the, clo or the uh, clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle or meek and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So very clearly, you know, we have this this, this through line throughout the scriptures regarding, um, reco regarding the, the humble and the meek spirit. But quite obviously, the greatest example that we have of, of um, someone who personified weak, uh, meekness is our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is one of, the, one of the key attributes, one of the key characteristics of Christ throughout, throughout the Gospels, and in particular here in the Gospel of Matthew. As the gospel goes on in chapter 11, Jesus will say things like, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, there it is again, and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the gentleness of Christ, um, the humility of Christ, the meekness of Christ um, is something that uh, that, is, that is quite on the surface. Once again, we're not, we're not digging here for anything that's, that's mysterious or, or hidden. And we're told in the gospel accounts that Christ's meekness, his restraint, his humility, just as Psalm 37 tells us, is the way in which he wages his war against evil. It's the way in which he defies evil and the evildoer. So, for example, when tempted by Satan to demonstrate his power, Rather than you know, exercising an outward display of his glory and, and, and taking up the authority that he has every right to use, well, instead, Christ does things like you know, he relies on the word of God and he endures the persecution to achieve uh, profound victories over, over evil. And, of course, the real glory uh, of the meekness of Christ is revealed in the very incarnation of God, right? The, um, though he was God in, incarnate, the Christ chose to veil his magnificent glory in the weakness 
of human flesh. He used the mode and the manner of humility and meekness to conceal all of his strength. And in the end, through his work on the cross, by going to the cross, um, even though the enemy thought he had defeated him, um, the enemy bruised his heel, he thought he had achieved a victory, well, the Christ turned the weapons of the enemy uh, against him and through his own death defeated death and Satan. Um, great example of meekness and, and humility. Christ achieved his great victory and fully secured his authority in the kingdom. Um, he came into his inheritance, he came into his inheritance, as it were, through this quality of humility and meekness. And so, as Christ reaffirms once again um, the very idea of Psalm, of Psalm 37, that the meek shall inherit the land, we find here this, this much more grand promise that Christ offers here. That not only do those who are meek inherit like the land of Canaan or the land of, of Israel, but we will come to inherit the entire earth. He, he uh, universalizes the notion of inheritance in a way that is fitting for the new covenant community, expanding the ideas of what we find in the psalm that we read to apply to his church, to apply to all people that have come to the Lord Jesus Christ and entered into his kingdom, people from every tribe and tongue and nation. He says that the way to that inheritance here and now as the citizens of his kingdom is by this quality that he possessed himself, this idea of of meekness. And once again, just, as, just if, if you were not convinced, which I'm sure you all are, uh, but if you weren't convinced by the testimony of Scripture, this is obviously a big deal throughout the church in her history. Um, and this idea of the meek being how we come into our, or, or meekness is how we come into our inheritance, and meekness is, is how we uh, wage our war against evil is found in places like, you know, like St. Augustine, Augustine. So he'll say things like this, that this is a very, that this is the very rest and life of the saints. That the meek are those who often yield to acts of wickedness and do not resist evil, but we overcome evil by doing good. Let those then who are not meek quarrel and fight for earthly and temporal things. But blessed are the meek, for they shall uh, by inheritance possess the earth from which they cannot be driven out. So obviously, uh, quite clearly right on the surface, once again, we don't have to look too far to recognize this quality as being fundamental to our conception of, of Christianity. And yet, even though that's the case, and as clear as it can appear to be on the surface, the very idea of meekness is not without its difficulties and challenges. And so the second thing I want us to see from, uh, from this passage is point number two, the critique of the meek. I used to rap. And that's not a joke. Uh, the critique of the meek. The very notion of meekness um, being somehow a strength or, a view or like a virtue, something that we esteem, well, I want us to know that that is a very distinct Christian idea. Um, that isn't just, you know, widely adopted and shared by other cultures and other religions and other, and other uh, you know, practices out in the world. That meekness is very clearly one of those things that sets Christianity apart. And our esteem of meekness, uh, it, sets, it sets us apart. Uh, and that has always been true since the founding of the church. I mean, it was particularly clear... In ancient times, right, when, um, and, and this, this, this idea of, of humility being a virtue was very strange and foreign and unheard of in the ancient world. When you consider the ancient religions and their common notions of, meek, of, 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 of virtue, well, humility and meekness were, were, not, were not things that you wanted to possess. They, it didn't make you noble. Um, in fact, it made you a laughingstock and it made you someone to be ridiculed. As one author writes when reflecting on this, um, it's from a book called Hobbit Virtues, by the way. It's a fascinating book. The guy's name is Christopher Snyder. He says this, that the Latin word for, for humility can denote you know, lowness, small stature, or insignificance. 
and at least in the Roman Empire, was always applied to the lowest social order. That the, that the humble, as distinct from those people who are honored or part of a high status or citizens or those who own property, well, the humble were to be, were, were to be despised or neglected. Um, they were the ones who, uh, who would encounter shame. And under Roman imperial law, it was only the, um, the humble who were subject to things like torture, torture of, 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 a, of a crucifixion, corporal punishment, these are what the ancients thought of the humble. They weren't, being humble and being meek wasn't, wasn't a virtue. Instead, the virtues that they cared about were the virtues associated with, with the gods and the warriors, the noble and the honorable, the strong. And it wasn't just the Romans um, who thought that humility was a negative characteristic. You can see this all over all sorts of ancient heroic literature, like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Iliad, for example, where heroes were those who were semi-divine and they were always aristocratic. They weren't common people. They weren't peasants. They weren't poor. And those heroes, those the, the truly virtuous, they were the ones who boasted of their strength. They were the ones who possessed all the political power. While the, hum, while the humble are rarely ever seen or talked about, and if they are, well, they're mocked and derided. So, for example, in the, in the Iliad, Homer depicts Odysseus um, literally berating a commoner with a scepter of royal power. He's like beating uh, a commoner, a, a humble man, with his royal scepter. And the poet says with the rest of the Greek soldiers in that, in that moment, speaking of the soldiers, their morale was low, but the men laughed. Good and hearty laughter. See, it's the keeping down the lowly and, and, and you know, beating those who are, who are meek and humble. Those are the things that made you, in the ancient world at least, virtuous. Glory, uh, conquest, securing a name for oneself, uh, those things require the virtues of like, of, you know, that, that those of great valor possess. It requires that you rise above you know, the, common, the common man. So it's amazing that it's into that uh, milieu that Christ is born. And with him, he brings about this explosion of a new set of values, a really backwards way of thinking, you know, back, back then. And this is that strange quality about Christianity that stood out among the ancient world. There's no doubt about that. There's this otherworldly quality um, for those who live according to Christ's kingdom with the meekness and the humility that is described here. You know, when Christ comes and says things like, the last shall be first, or he does wild things like, you know, not just care for the poor, but invite them to big dinner parties, uh, when he encourages Christians to give away their money, or the Christians start giving away their money, or they start adopting, you know, discarded children, rather than letting just letting children be sold into slavery or discarded on the side of the road. They pick them up, they... They adopt them. They do things like turn the other cheek. They live uh, for, a, for, for a world that is to come. All those things were radical um, with the advent of the, of the church among the, the Greek and Roman world. And at its best moments, the advance of the church has come through this disposition of meekness. And yet, as history marched on, um, to see this massive spread of, of Christianity across the known world, this quality of meekness has always come under fire. It has always been the target of Christ's enemies in every age. I mean, the, the most well-known amongst moderns to express his disdain for, for valuing humility and meekness is, is most likely uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Or Nietzsche, depending on how you say it. He's one who wrote, I, I condemn Christianity. I bring, I bring against the Christian church the most terrible of all accusations that, that an accuser has ever had in his mouth. It is to me the greatest of all imaginable corruptions. And that's what he said about Christianity. Um, and what got him so riled up? 
what's the charge? What did he get? So, what was he so so put off by? What did, what did he he claimed to be the greatest of all imaginable corruptions? Well, as Chris Castaldo summarizes once again, that according to Nietzsche, Christianity is guilty. It's guilty of undermining the proper order of life by emasculating men and by suppressing their will to power. Uh, Nietzsche's idea, uh, or ideal human, is not the meek servant, but the warrior who dominates other. According to Nietzsche, I keep saying that, that, that name differently. Uh, according to Nietzsche, it's this idea of meekness that he hates. And he sees Christianity as the loss of those great heroic virtues of the ancient world, of the strong man, the uberman. The problem is meekness, or what he understands to be meekness. And still, to this day, this critique is very hard to shake off. It's still with us today. And it takes all sorts of new forms packaged in new, in new ways all the time. See, the cross... The cross of Christ and its counterintuitive uh, exaltation of the weak and humble things over the world, it doesn't make sense to the natural man. It's this element of the gospel that is supernatural in its origin. You only get this if it's revealed by God. It goes against every, uh, everything that we know via nature. See, for the world, this, pro the, this proposition found in this beatitude, it doesn't, it doesn't compute at all because in every course of life, the meek and the lowly, the humble, the weak, um, they don't win. They don't prosper. They shouldn't prosper. I mean, if you engage in athletic competition, if you're trying to win, you don't pick the worst player out there um, for your team. Foolishness and humility in, in the natural order doesn't breed success. It's not a profound strategy for any type of success, whether it be in academics or your pursuit of your career, athletics, whatever you, whatever you name. And I think that we definitely do feel in a very serious way today um, how the retreat of Christianity from the public square, just from public consciousness, just you know, the loss of, of Christian values, that it really has a profound effect, effect here that the loss of honoring meekness and seeing the value in humility is really at the center of, of how um, our, our shared cultural ethic has, is shifting and changing. I mean, you definitely see that sense heightened if you like go online, God forbid, and go on something like Twitter and see, and see the discourse. Because no matter where you look, you're gonna find a, find a, like a slew of online tough guys, right, who, who portray, the, or who portray this um, line of thinking, they parrot this line of thinking, that Christianity in its introduction and its exaltation of the meek and humble has actually done damage to the world. And what we need is a recovery of the strong man. Um, Christianity's weakness is a loser mentality. And it just so happens that Along with that, for those who do have a taste for religion, um, you find Islam growing, growing like crazy rapidly uh, all, over, all, all over places of the world like Europe. Because that religion, just like the natural way of, way of thinking, is one that values honor more than it does this, this quality of meekness and humility. The sad thing, though, is that this isn't just something that is found outside the church. Uh, but it's also creeping into the life of the church. You, know, you talk to some and you get a general sense that there's, a, there's this disdain growing for what is perceived to be weakness within the church. Um, that there's this critique of a, of a loser mentality online. And there's even call, you know, calls with, within the church to reclaim, well, the Roman ideals, and the Roman virtues. Virtues that have more to do with the Greek pantheon than with the crucified Christ of the Bible. So really, what is going on? That's why I'm taking this, this tack and this approach uh, here this morning. What is going on? Is it time for us to seek new alternatives to the way of meekness and humility? Are we at the point now where it is necessary to, um, 
to take different, different tactics. Does this critique have its merit? You know, if we want things like dominion, if we want to inherit the earth, if we want to possess influence or, or power and sway, if we want to master both ourselves and the world, do we need to take a different approach? What are we doing insisting on the way of meekness in a world today? Well, the third thing I want us to see is point number three, the path of the meek. The path of the meek. Oftentimes, if you hear people critique, you know, humility and meekness, um, there's, they're making a profound error in their critiques because many, if, whether, they're, whether they are you know, Christians or otherwise, that they are associating uh, meekness with apathy or with being weak. They're confusing the idea of being meek with having an indifference towards evil, being indifferent to what happens in the world and whether or not the church uh, succeeds in her mission. Uh, in her mission. They're confusing being meek and humble, um, being re restrained, with being a loser and accusing the meek of not raising an eyebrow when evil assails you, whether it assails you personally, your family, your church, your community. They think that being meek is just an attitude of rolling over. But really that's not the case at all. Because the idea of being meek, at least in the Bible, well, on the one hand, it demands that we not take up the weapons of, of the enemy and engage in like a tit-for-tat back and forth with evil, right? We don't use their means. But it also means that we recognize that success in this age is not about securing and, exercise, and exercising worldly power. Success is not defined by defending our name or defending our rights. Meekness is rather the humble action of recognizing that the way of the cross of Christ is the way in which we will resist evil and the way in which we're going to overcome. Once again, as, August as Augustine said, this is how we overcome evil by doing good. Meekness is our resistance. You want to couch, like you want to join some countercultural movement if you don't want to, if, like if you don't want to fit in, and if you want to be different, um, you want, if you want to be unique, just like everybody else. Um, well, this is how you protest. Redemptive, Christ-centered suffering and gentleness is how we move about in the world, and in the end, it is how Christ's church wins the day. And yet, even in saying that, our whole idea of victory, our idea of success, our idea of conquest, um, it has to be accomplished according to Christ's terms. We have to understand what the Bible says uh, uh, or understand how those things are accomplished, redefine those terms um, according to the witness of Christ. We have to redefine what it means to win. We have, to re, we have to be retrained to understand what it means to wage uh, warfare, what to expect, and how we measure success. All of that is utterly transformed in the crucifixion of Christ and in the coming of his kingdom. Because Christ is so much more than just an example of a man who was meek. But he is meekness incarnate. His life, the life that we are joined to, is the ultimate triumph of the weak, over the strong, of the wisdom of God over the wisdom of the world, the humble and the foolishness of God triumphing over the wisdom of the world. In Christ's person, we have the powers of the world to come, vanquishing the powers of this present evil age, and that is all accomplished through meekness. He uses the cross as his weapon of choice uh, to crush the head of Satan and enter into his kingdom. And if that's the means Christ uses to live and to win, 
Well, so too it is for us. No servant is above his master. So, as he walked in meekness and humility, as he was despised and rejected by men, so do we. But the trick is, to see such a, to see such a life as your victory and as your triumph. And this, this very notion is what has perplexed and infuriated uh, the natural man throughout all of history. They don't get upset because the humble are pitiful, but they get upset because those that are humble in Christ are fortified by him and they carry with them a supernatural strength that brings their wisdom to open shame and to mockery. Meekness and humility and love is our strength. And this is what has made the church resilient throughout all of history. And this is what has made us tough and given us success. As Dostoevsky is quoted as saying, loving humility is marvelously strong. The strongest of all things because there is nothing else like it. And in the end, the meek the humble, the misunderstood, uh, the ridiculed, the maligned. Once again, we win. And our reward is nothing less than what Christ, the meek and mild servant, won when he turned the weapons of the enemy against the world. We inherit the glorified earth, the world. And yet, while that is true both now uh, and, is, and will be consummated at some day uh, upon the second coming. We must pass through the pains of our own cross-bearing here in this age, even for some of us to the point of death. The saying that is uh, attributed to, to, to uh, uh, Tertullian is not, you know, it's not a laughing matter. that The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Um, our sufferings and our way of meekness and humility in the world will come at a cost for all of us. You know, living for him and his values in this upside-down way, this is, this, this, is, this is backwards thinking. It's very unnatural to the natural man. But we are at our best when we allow Christ to rule and to rule us according um, to the ways of his kingdom. And this will always put us at odds with the nations in every age. And yet this has been the testimony of the church throughout time. Let me just read you one example. I think I've used this, I've shared this example before. This is from, this is from the letter to, uh, uh, to Dionetus or, Di or Diagnetus. This is roughly second or third century. So this is, this is old. But listen to the way in which they describe the way of the Christian, the way of the meek, and how at odds that is with, with the world in which they live. Speaking of, of a meek Christian witness, he says, It is true that Christians are in the flesh, but they do not live according to the flesh. They busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws, but in their own lives they go far beyond what the law requires. They love all men, and by all men are persecuted. They are unknown and still they are condemned. They are put to death, and yet they are brought to life. They are poor, and yet they make many rich. They are completely destitute, and yet they enjoy complete abundance. They are dishonored, and in their very dishonor are glorified. They are defamed and are vindicated. They are reviled, and yet they bless. When they are affronted, they still pay due respect. When they do good, they are punished by evildoers. When undergoing punishment, they rejoice because they are brought to life. They are treated by the Jews as foreigners and enemies and are hunted down by the Greeks. And at all times, those who hate them find it impossible to justify their enmity. It's the second or third century. And yet, 
it is true that we live in a tumultuous time, but our experience is no, is, is no less harder um, than the saints of old. We want a leg up. We want a seat at the table. We want a voice. We want influence. We want to win. But it's not going to come through the abandonment of humility and forsaking the shame of the cross of Christ. We don't, you know, we don't start our lives in Christ one way and then shift gears and shift focus um, at another later point once we've reached a certain, a certain, a, a certain uh, stage of maturity or we encounter new problems. No, we, don't, we don't begin our lives in Christ via a theology of the cross and then at some point exchange that for a theology of glory. In many ways and in many times, it is not our place to redress wrongs that have been done to us, to fight fire with fire, to take offense, to have a loose tongue, to have a, a quick temper. We are not people of that ancient warrior spirit either, demanding that we uphold our own sense of honor when it comes under attack. We do not take dominion over the earth by seizing it by way of force uh, and fighting for the rights of our own name. Rather, we receive the earth from the one who already has possession over it. And this is really the crux of the, of the issue. This is the key thing, that to be meek and humble is a matter of faith in Christ. And I say that because we confess that Christ has all authority now that he's ruling at the right hand of the Father even now, and that it's from his hand and by his promise that he will grant us all things. And so we are faced with the choice. Will we trust that? Will we believe in that? Will we set and fix our hopes on that and go about our lives in the manner in which he says we will receive um, that inheritance, which is by being humble and meek before men? Or... Will we choose another way? Will we bring, uh, will we carve out some space, whether it's in the world or in our lives, where um, by our actions we confess that we do not think Christ is ruling and reigning? This is a matter of trust and conviction. Is Jesus trustworthy enough? Is this, is this real? Do we believe it? Are you convinced? Am I convinced enough of his dominion and authority? Or are we going to fight um, for our own rights and wage uh, and, or, and, and go the way of glory as our way of casting down our hope in Christ's promises? I'm going to end with this. Um, Calvin, in his commentary on, on the Gospels, really has a clear word that summarizes how to understand this beatitude. So this is Calvin um, on verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He says this, By the meek, Christ means persons of mild and gentle dispositions, who are not easily provoked by injuries, uh, who are not ready to take offense, but are prepared to endure anything rather than do the like actions to wicked men. When Christ promises to such persons the inheritance of the earth, we might think it exceedingly foolish. Those who warmly repel any attacks and whose hand is ever ready to revenge injuries are rather the persons who claim for themselves the dominion of the earth. An experience sh certainly shows that the more mildly their wickedness is endured, the more bold and insolent does it behave. Hence arises the diabolical proverb that we must howl with the wolves because the wolves will immediately devour everyone who makes himself a sheep. But Christ places his own protection and that of the Father in contrast with the, fury, with the fury and the violence of wicked men, and declares on good grounds that the meek will be the lords and heirs of the earth. And here's the kicker. 
He says that the children of this world never think themselves safe, except when they fiercely revenge the injuries that are done them and defend their life by the weapons of war. But as we must believe that Christ alone is the guardian of our life, all that remains for us is to hide ourselves under the shadow of his wings. We must be sheep if we wish to be reckoned a part of his flock. Well, may that ring true for all of us in our hearts um, as those who seek to be sheeple of the good shepherd, the good shepherd who will lead you and I to green pastures and the still waters of the kingdom. Let's pray.